Hello again, everyone. This is Mr. V. Hill, and today we are going to talk about radicals. And so radicals are just a fancy word that we use to talk about, really, for our purposes, just square roots. So the radical is actually this little symbol here that you've all seen before, I'm sure, many times. So we take this little symbol of something. Uh, that's what we call the square root. There are other kinds of roots, cube roots, fourth roots, there are rational roots, uh, all kinds of stuff. But for our purposes, we're just going to stick with talking about square roots today. And so the way a square root works is pretty simple, right? Uh, if you had an example like a square root of 169, hopefully you all know that that is 13. Because... 13 squared is 169. Right? Basically the idea is that the square root of something is the thing that, well, when you square it, you get that something. kind of a funny way of defining something, but that's exactly what it is. The square root of 169 is 13 because 13 squared equals 69. 13 is the thing that you, when you square it, you get 169, okay? But this gets a little bit goofy here because, well, the square root of 169, given this definition, we could also say that that is negative 13 because, of course, if we take negative 13 and we square it, negative 13 times negative 13 is again 169. So basic idea here is that most things have two square roots, the positive one and the negative one. So we need to in come up with some notation to specify which one we want. So this thing, just this radical symbol itself, that is going to refer to the positive or sometimes we call it the principal square root. If we want the negative one, then hold crazy, crazy thing here, we're gonna put a negative sign in front of the radical. So you see the negative sign in front of it? This means we're talking about the negative square root. Okay, as well. This symbol is just the positive one. You slap a negative sign on it, you get the negative one. Pretty simple, right? But in a lot of situations, we want both square roots. And so we're gonna bring back some notation that we introduced way back when we were talking about absolute values. The way you undid an absolute value was with this weird little symbol of a plus and a minus sign together. If we put that in front of the radical, then that means we're talking about both square roots. So we're talking about two different numbers at the same time. Okay, so that's just the notation there. And, well, basically the idea of why we're doing this is, let me see here, where we're going with all of this is basically we want to eventually solve a radical equation. Or really solving a quadratic equation. Um, so if we have something like this, x squared is equal to, say, um, 25. Well, we need to be able to undo this squaring in order to solve the equation. Right? And the basic idea here is that the operation that we're trying to undo is the squaring function. And so we need to know what the inverse of that thing is. And it just so happens that the inverse of the squaring function is exactly this thing, the positive and the negative square root. So basically what we do is, in order to undo the squaring, we're going to apply this operation to both sides of the equation. So we take the positive and the negative square root of this thing and the positive and negative square root of this thing and what's going to happen 
is basically this positive negative square root here is going to cancel with this squaring here and all that we're left with is the x. So x is now equal to the positive and the negative square root of 25. But we know what the square root of 25 is. It's just 5. So what this equation here is saying, x is equal to plus or minus 5, that really means that we have two different equations finishing this thing up. That x is equal to 5 or x could also be equal to negative 5. And we can check those, as we should always check when we're solving equations. We just plug in these values into the original equation and see if we get a true statement out. So we plug in the 5, 5 squared, and we ask ourselves, is that actually equal to 25? And of course, yeah, it is. But then we ought to check this other one. And remember, when we're plugging stuff in, even with positive values, we should put parentheses around it. We plug in negative 5 for x. We ask ourselves, is that actually equal to 25? And yes, negative 5 times negative 5 is, of course, 25. So we'll say that our solution set consists of these two values, 5 and negative 5. So that's where we're going with all of this. But we'll get to that more later. Before we do, I want to talk a little bit real quickly about square roots of negative numbers. So what in the world would this be if we had, say, the square root of, of course we're talking about the positive square root, so we don't have any symbol out front here, negative 25. What in the world is that equal to? Well, the basic idea here is we're trying to figure out, well, what number will, can we square to get what's inside here, negative 25? So we really want to solve this equation. x squared is equal to negative 25. So what can we put in here? Well, let's think here. We've really got three different kinds of numbers that are what we're dealing with in Algebra 1. We have positive numbers, negative numbers, and zero. So if we put a positive number in here, a positive number squared, right, a positive times another positive is of course going to be a positive number, not negative 25. If we take a negative number and we square it, well, that's going to be a negative number times a negative number. That's, again, going to be a positive number. Or if we take 0 and we square that, well, 0 times 0 is, of course, 0. And we get 0. But we certainly don't get a negative number here. So the idea here is, well, the square root of a negative number, well, it can't be either a positive number, a negative number, or a 0. Meaning, well, Here's the number line. Positive numbers here, here. Negative numbers are here. Zero's right there. None of these things on this number line, when you square it, will you get a negative number. So the basic idea here is the square root of a negative number is not a real number. And by that, I mean I'm not talking about it. It might be a fake number. It's just not in the set of real numbers which occupy this number line. So it is something else. It's what's called a complex number, but we're not going to deal with that in Algebra 1. For Algebra 1, we're just going to say basically the idea is that you can't take the square root of a negative. And for right now, that is enough to get you by. Okay. Now, next thing, I'm going to talk about our irrational square roots. Okay. So this is going. So basically, if you're taking a square root of a number, occasionally you'll get lucky and it'll be a nice integer, like the square root of 169 was 13. But any number that is not a perfect square and by perfect square, of course, I mean, well, integers that come about by squaring another integer, like, um, well, of course,
course, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and of course 5 squared is 25, 36, so on and so forth. These numbers are perfect squares. But any number that's not one of these, 5, 22, anything like that, any number that's not a perfect square will have an irrational square root. Okay, so for instance, like the square root of 7, if we were to punch that in your calculator, really quick, like my batteries are going low, the square root of 7, enter that in, well, that's going to be approximately 2.645, yada, yada, yada. But the thing is, that's irrational. So this decimal expansion right here is never going to end. It is never going to terminate. So there's no point in even trying to write out the decimal expansion of it. The square root of 7 is just the square root of 7. Well, it's, again, the number that equals 7 when you square it. meaning basically the square root of 7, if we take that and we square it, we get 7. The square root and the squaring kind of cancel each other out like that. But the square root of 7, that's all it is. It's an irrational number. We can't do anything more with it. That's it. Now, moving on to the next thing. What we really want to get at here with this uh, lesson is what's called simplified radical form. So we're going to be simplifying expressions um, that involve square roots. So of course simplifying means, well of course once again you have to do all the arithmetic you can to include the distributive property, combining like terms and all of those good things, not having any negative exponents in it, uh, no fractions within fractions, all of that good stuff that we talked about so far. Plus, we're just going to talk about two cards. There's four things that we need to talk about, but today we're just going to deal with two. The first one is we want no perfect square factors. Underneath the radical. Of course, and by this I mean perfect square factors other than 1, because everything is going to have a factor of 1 in it, but that's just trivial. The second thing that we're going to have to do is we have to combine all the like radical terms. And we'll talk about what like radical terms are in just a moment. It's basically the same thing as combining like terms that we talked about before it's with a slight tweak. But first, let's deal with criteria number one. And the way we're going to deal with this one is by applying what's called the product property for radicals. Let's switch up the pens. I think this one's kind of dying. And what the product property for radicals states is that if we have the square root of a product, say A times B, we can split that radical up and have it be the square root of A times the square root of B. Basically, we distribute the radical to each of these factors. And the reason why that works, well, the basic idea here is if you take the square root of x squared, that's going to be x. Because x is the thing that when you square it, you get x squared. But let's consider a slight different way take on this here. If we take x squared, and then we raise that to the power of one half. Well, what in the heck is a 
exponent of one half. How do you multiply one half of something together? It's or one half of a copy of something. It doesn't really make sense, right? Until we simplify this thing. Right? This is a power being raised to another power. Of course, the power rule says that we're going to then multiply the exponents together. So this would be two times one half. But we know what two times one half is, that's just one. So if we square something and then raise it to the power of one half, we get back to the original something. Meaning these two things undo each other in the same way that square rooting and squaring undo each other. So really, this square root symbol is exactly an exponent of one half. Okay, so since the square root is an exponent, it's going to behave just like an exponent. We had the product property for exponents, so it makes sense that we're also going to have a product property for radicals. So, but how are we going to apply this to simplifying expressions? Well, let's just go through a quick example here. Suppose we wanted to simplify the square root of 72. Okay, well, Let's see here. First off, we might just try it in the calculator here. So we take the square root of 72. Let's see what that thing is. Well, it's nothing nice. Right? Again, we're going to see an infinite decimal expansion, so there's no point in trying to even write that thing. But what we can do, if we're clever, we can notice 72 well, that has a perfect square factor in it of 36. 72 is exactly 36 times 2. So we're taking the square root of this product. This property says that we can split up that square root. So this thing is actually equal to the square root of 36 times the square root of 2. But we know what the square root of 36 is. It's just 6. So now the only thing that's left underneath the radical is the 2. And of course, 2 has no perfect square factors. Heck, it's prime. So now this is in simplified radical form. Okay. Now, what if we weren't so clever to notice that 36 was a factor of 72? Well, what we can do We'll just try perfect squares and see if they are factors. So let's take 72. We're not worried about 1 because everything has a factor of 1. But in the next perfect square would be 4. So let's try it. Divide 72 by 4. Oh, it's 18. OK. So the square root of 72 is actually equal to the square root of 4 times 18. Because 4 times 18 is equal to 72. Fantastic. So let's simplify this now a little bit. We can split up the radical again between these two factors. The square root of 4 times the square root of 18. But now we know what the square root of 4 is. It's 2. But we can't stop there. Because we got an 18 in here. We got to make sure that what's underneath the radical has no perfect square factors. So let's try 18. We'll divide that by 4. OK? Doesn't divide evenly, so 4 is not a factor of 18. The next perfect square is 9. And we should know this, of course. Right? That's 2, right? So this whole thing is going to be equal to 2 times, instead of the square root of 18, we'll write square root of 2 times 9. <laughs> yeah. So. Now, well, actually, we could just probably split this up again or switch around the 9 and the 2 just to make our lives a little bit simpler. So we'll split up this radical here. This is 2 times the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. We're just distributing this radical to each of these factors. And now we know what the square root of 9 is. So this is now 2 times the square root of 9, which is 3 times 
the square root of 2. And again, of course, 2 times 3 is just 6. And again, 2 has no perfect square factors, of course. It's prime, so we're done. But one thing we might want to do here before we go on, we can check our answer with a calculator. Just ask ourselves, well, again, square root of 72 is equal to that thing. Our simplified version we're saying is 6 times the square root of 2. Oh, and wouldn't you know it, they're the same irrational number. Fantastic. Or at least we're pretty darn certain because the decimal expansion in the calculator is, matches up perfectly out to quite a number of decimal places. Fantastic. One thing we want to do here, though, is we want to be really careful about roots of sums. So for instance, if we have the square root of, say, 16 plus 9. Again, it's really, really, really tempting to split up the radical between these two terms. But let's check this out here. 16 plus 9 is, of course, 25. And we know what the square root of 25 is. That's 5. If we split up this radical and look at the square root of 16 plus the square root of 9, well, we know what the square root of 16 is. That's 4. We know what the square root of 9 is. That's 3. So that's 7. Notice they're not the same. So just like with exponents, don't try to distribute a radical to a sum. It doesn't work. Okay. But really quick, let's do one more example just to make sure we've got this. Example 2. Let's try plus or minus the square root of 3,528. Okay. No big deal. We're just throwing on this extra plus or minus symbol, saying that we want both the positive and the negative square root of this thing. It, do, it doesn't change anything. So we're, all we're going to do is just the whole simplification process, we're going to keep this plus or minus with us so we don't forget that we want both positive and negative square roots. Now, we might want to try this out just to be sure. We'll take the square root of 3,528. Okay, definitely, that, it's not a perfect square, so we can't just go really simple. And let's so listen again. Let's try try out a few different perfect squares. Three thousand five hundred twenty-eight. Smallest perfect square is four. We'll try that one. Oh, okay, cool. It divides evenly into three thousand five hundred twenty-eight. So this thing is actually equal to plus or minus the square root of four times eight hundred eighty-two. So we can split up the radical here. We still got our plus or minus sign the square root of 4 times the square root of 882. And again, we know what the square root of 4 is. So we just do that square root. Next, we'll take 882. Divide that by 4, see if it goes even in there. Nope. So let's try the next one. 882 divided by 9. OK, great. So what we have here is actually plus or minus 2 times the square root of 9 times 98. Again, now we can split up this radical into the square root of 9 times the square root of 98. But we know what the square root of 9 is, plus or minus 2 times 3 times the square root of 98. But we know what 2 times 3 is. So we're down to plus or minus 6 times the square root of 98. Now, let's see if 98 has any perfect square factors. First, we'll divide it by 9 again. Nope. 
divide it by 16. Nope. Divided by 25, of course, no. 98 divided by 36, no. 98 divided by the next perfect square is 49. Yes, okay, yeah, now, now we should see it, right? So this is actually equal to plus or minus six times the square root of 49 times two. And split up this radical, plus or minus six times the square root of 49 times the square root of two, but we know what the square root of 49 is. Seven times the square root of two, and we know what six times seven is, of course, 42 times the square root of two. And finally, of course, two does not have any perfect square factors, so this is now the simplified version. But again, let's check to make sure we did this right. Square root of 3,528. Oops. And my calculator is dying. Let me grab a fresh one really quick. Again, the square root of 3,528 just gives us that. But 42 times the square root of 2. Oh yes, yeah, the same thing. Fantastic. All right, so we did it right. Now, so that was just with numbers though. Since we're in algebra, of course, we're gonna have variables. So let's see how to deal with that. Example three. Suppose you wanted to do the square root of, say, x to the power of five. Well, a calculator ain't gonna help us here. But what's nice here is x to the fifth, that most definitely has a perfect square factor in it. Because x to the fifth is the same thing as x squared times x cubed. And again, we can split up this radical now as a square root of x squared times the square root of x cubed. And we know what the square root of x squared is. It's just x. So now we have x times the square root of x cubed. Oh, but wait, x cubed has another perfect square factor in it, x squared. So we can rewrite x cubed as x squared times x. Fantastic. Split up the radical again. X times the square root of x squared times the square root of x. And now we know what the square root of x squared is. It's x. So it's x times x times the square root of x. But we know what x times x is. x squared. And now, of course, x it just has that one factor in there, so there's no more perfect square factors under the radical, and this is now simplified. If we're clever though, we can do this a little bit more quickly, because the square root of x to the fifth, we could write as the square root of x to the fourth times x. And x to the fourth, really any even power on a variable is going to be a perfect square. So this is going to be the square root of x to the fourth times the square root of x when we split up the radical. And well, we need to know what is the square root of x to the fourth. Well, it's the thing that when you square it, you get x to the fourth, which is of course x squared. Again, same thing. Just if we're clever, we choose the biggest perfect square factor and then split up the radical. One last little thing that we're gonna have to deal with is like radical terms. And so basically, if the exact same thing is under the radical in two different terms, then those things are like radical terms. For instance, the square root of 15 plus the square root of 15. 
they're the exact same square root. So kind of in a way we can add these two things together. I mean of course it's, these are both irrational numbers because 15 is not a perfect square. But this is a, an addition, right? Repeated addition. We have one copy of this thing here, one copy of this thing here. So really what we have are two of those things. Something plus another something is two of those somethings. No big deal. Hopefully that's pretty instinctive for you. But we can also subtract things. So suppose we had 8 times the square root of 7 minus 5 times the square root of 7. Well, we've got 8 of these things. I'm subtra subtracting off 5 of those same things. So what we end up with are 3 of those things. No big deal. Suppose we had something a little bit different, so say square root of 3 plus the square root of 2. Well, here we're taking the square root of 3, here we're taking the square root of 2. We're not taking the square root of the same thing, so these are not like radical terms. So we can't really do anything with that. This expression right here is already simplified. We can't do any more arithmetic there. Or suppose we had some a square root of a variable. That's fine. Square root of x minus, say, 8 times the square root of x. Well, if we have one of those things, and we subtract off 8 of those things, of course, we're going to end up with negative 7 of those things. Pretty simple. Although occasionally, sometimes you're going to see things that look like they're not like radical terms, but you might be able to do a little simplifying first. Like say, the square root of 18 plus 2 times the square root of 2. Of course, we're not taking the square root of the same thing in each of these terms. So at first you think, oh, no way I can combine those things. But square root of 18, 18 has a perfect square factor of 9, right? So the square root of 18 is actually the square root of 9 times 2. We split up the radical here. Square root of 9 times the square root of 2. But we know what the square root of 9 is. That's 3. And now, once we simplified this square root of 18, now we see that we actually do have like radical terms here. 3 of these square root of 2's plus 2 more of these square roots of 2's, well, that gives us 5 of those things. So it's 5 times the square root of 2. And that's how you combine like radical terms.